Now, in the 18th chapter, we see that this man Saul had a son, Jonathan, that we've seen before. Jonathan was an outstanding man, and David and Jonathan became very wonderful friends because, actually, David was Jonathan's kind of man, and Jonathan was David's kind of man, and they both were outstanding men, and they are men that God can use, by the way. And we find that Saul becomes jealous of David because of the people's applause. Now, notice this as we come to it here in chapter 18, and we'll move right along. I'm reading now 1 Samuel 18, verse 1. And it came to pass when he had made an end of speaking unto Saul. That is, David was speaking to Saul. You remember that Saul called him in after the battle, wanted to recognize him wanted to give him a recognition, and he did. And I think he felt like he gave him too much, though, because of what happened later. But as Jonathan, the son of Saul, stood there listening to David, while we are told that the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. The relationship of these two men is quite wonderful. We speak so much today of the love of a man for a woman, and that is wonderful. But there's nothing that is as fine and noble as when two men that are outstanding men as these were, they see in each other actually a mirror of themselves, and they're drawn together. They are friends. They can have their athletics together, their recreation together. They work together and their social life together. David and Jonathan were drawn together. And we're told here, verse 2, And Saul took him that day and would let him go no more home to his father's house. David now becomes a public figure, and he occupies that position the rest of his life. Verse 3, Then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. These two would stick together. And There's nothing quite like it. They can form clubs today named for these men, but you don't find quite the friendship that these men had. And in verse 4, And Jonathan stripped himself of his robe that was upon him, gave it to David and his garments, even to his sword, to his bow, and to his girdle. You see, after all, David was a peasant boy. He'd been herding sheep, and he'd come up to the palace And actually, he didn't have the clothes for it. And so Jonathan just turned over to him one of his many changes of garments and shared his wardrobe with him. And it was a very generous thing to do. And in verse 5, And David went out whithersoever Saul went and behaved himself wisely. Saul set him over the men of war, And he was accepted in the sight of all the people and also in the sight of Saul's servants. Now, David had that charisma that we hear so much about today that made him accepted to the public. David is actually a great man. God looked on his heart. The people looked on the outside, but David is good on both inside and outside. Now, he sinned. We will see that when we get to it. And I think that we'll be able to offer an explanation that will be satisfactory. And we're told that it came to pass as they came when David was returned from the slaughter of the Philistine that the women came out of all the cities of Israel singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tablets, with joy, and with instruments of music. But notice what they said. They had a new song. And the women answered one another as they played and said, Saul hath slain his thousands, and David his ten thousands. Now, Saul's not going to like that. Notice verse 8. And Saul was very wroth, and the saying displeased him. And he said, They have ascribed unto David ten thousands, and to me they have ascribed but thousands. And what can he have more but the kingdom? And he's right. He will get the kingdom also. 
And saw I David from that day and forward. You see, now Saul becomes jealous of David because of the people's applause and acceptance of him. And we'll see now that he'll make an attempt to destroy him, to remove him. And we'll see that David does become the favorite of the people. So David sees that this man is not as friendly as he once was, that he is actually jealous of him. And we read in verse 10, it came to pass on the morrow that the evil spirit from God came upon Saul. He prophesied in the midst of the house, and David played with his hand as at other times, and there was a javelin in Saul's hand. This is quite a dramatic scene. There is David playing on a harp. There's Saul sitting over there playing on a javelin. David knows what he's got in mind, and he's watching that javelin, not his musical instrument. He may have hit a sour note or two, I don't know, but he doesn't want that javelin going through him. And it came at last, Saul cast the javelin, for he said, I'll smite David even to the wall with it. He wanted to get rid of him. I tell you, David dodged and he departed. He took French leave and he got out of that palace and that area as quickly as he could. And Saul saw that he behaved himself very wisely and now he becomes afraid of him. In verse 16, we're told, but all Israel and Judah loved David because he went out and came in before them. David now is the one that is being accepted. And so Saul is wondering how he can trap him. And he uses a very clever method. He gives him his daughter for wife. And that puts him in the family where he can get to David any time that he would want to. And this girl, Michael, I do not think David ever loved her. And I don't think she ever loved David. There came the day when she ridiculed him and despised him, and he put her aside. We blame David for so many marriages, but actually he certainly got off to a bad start here with this girl. And I read verse 20, And Michael, Saul's daughter, loved David. And somebody says, But you say she didn't love David. Well, you know that type of love we're talking about. There came the day when she hated him. And here at the beginning it was that love of the hero and the fact that he is the popular one at the time. But it was not that marital love that's needed to make a success of marriage. And they told Saul, and the thing pleased him. And so he gave his daughter to David. And this was not a successful, a good marriage at all. And actually, it didn't work out as we're going to see. Now we come to chapter 19, and we will find that the thing that happens is that Saul now openly attempts to have David slain. He personally here attempts to slay him with a javelin as David plays upon his harp. And David escapes, and he becomes as a hunted man. And let me just get into this chapter. I'm going to deal with it, I think, rather hurriedly, because this is a section we can pass through rather hurriedly. In the 19th chapter now, I'm reading verse 1 of First Samuel. And Saul spake to Jonathan his son and to all his servants that they should kill David. But Jonathan, Saul's son, delighted much in David. And Jonathan told David, saying, Saul, my father, seeketh to kill thee. Now therefore I pray thee, take heed to thyself until the morning, and abide in a secret place, and hide thyself. He said to him, I want you to get out of here, because your life is in danger here in the palace. Now he said, I'll go out and stand beside my father in the field, where thou art, and I'll commune with my father of thee, and what I see that I'll tell thee. And Jonathan spoke good of David unto Saul his father, and said unto him, Let not the king sin against his servant, against David, because he hath not sinned against thee, and because his works have been to thee were very good. 
He's actually helped you. He's a wonderful citizen of your kingdom, and he's a wonderful follower of yours, and you ought not to try to kill him. But notice verse 5, but he did put his life in his hand and slew the Philistine. The Lord wrought a great salvation for all Israel. Thou sawest it and didst rejoice. Wherefore then wilt thou sin against innocent blood to slay David without a cause? And Saul hearkened unto the voice of Jonathan, and Saul swear as the Lord liveth, he shall not be slain. Now Jonathan calls David, and Jonathan showed him all those things, and Jonathan brought David to Saul, and he was in his presence as in times past. Now he comes back to the palace, but he's wary because he knows his life is in danger. And we're told there was war again, and David went out and fought with the Philistines and slew them with a great slaughter, and they fled from him. But notice the reaction of King Saul to this. And the evil spirit from the Lord was upon Saul, as he sat in his house with his javelin in his hand. And David played with his hand. Now again, we have this very dramatic scene. David is playing. Saul is fingering his javelin. Well, we know what he's going to do. David knows that the time will come and he will throw that javelin with the intent of pinning David to the wall. Verse 10, And Saul sought to smite David even to the wall with the javelin, but he slipped away out of Saul's presence, and he smote the javelin into the wall. And David fled and escaped that night. Now David knows it's no longer safe to be in the presence of Saul. But he's married to Saul's daughter. Verse 11, Saul also sent messengers unto David's house to watch him and to slay him in the morning. And Michael, David's wife, told him, saying, If thou save not thy life tonight, tomorrow thou shalt be slain. Now here at the beginning, Michael is on his side. Michael let David down through a window, and he went down and fled and escaped. And Michael took an image and laid it in the bed, put a pillow of goat's hair for his bolster, and covered it with a cloth, just as if David was in bed there with her. And when Saul sent messengers to take David, she said, He's sick. And Saul sent the messengers again to see David, saying, Bring him up to me in the bed, that I may slay him. And the messengers were come in. Behold, there was an image in the bed with a pillar of goat's hair for his bolster. And Saul said unto Michael, Why hast thou deceived me? So I sent away mine enemy, that he's escaped. And Michael answered Saul. He said unto me, Let me go. Why should I kill thee? In other words, she says why he would have killed me if I didn't let him escape. Now we are told that David fled and escaped, and he came to Samuel to Ramah, told him all that Saul had done to him, and he and Samuel went and dwelt in Nioth. Actually, this man Samuel's life would be in danger now because he's the one that had anointed him as king, and so his life would be in grave danger. Now, what will the future hold for David at this particular time? because Saul now openly is attempting to slay him. And David now becomes just like a hunted animal from here on until the death of Saul. Now, Jonathan, the son of Saul, proves his love for David by protecting him. And we're going to see that in chapter 20 now. And Jonathan communicates with David the intentions of Saul by the means of shooting these arrows. And he had to do it because Saul knows now that even Michael, his daughter, has deceived him. And he knows that Jonathan and David are good friends. And so Jonathan has to be very wary, very careful, and very secretive about getting a communication to David. And he uses this method. And we find it here in chapter 20. I begin reading now at verse 1. 
And David fled from Nioth in Ramah, and came and said before Jonathan, What have I done? What is mine iniquity? And what is my sin before thy father, that he seeketh my life? David says, What have I done? He had actually helped Saul. But you see, this man, he was never a king. God knew he wasn't. He wasn't God's choice. But it was the same thing that you have in the time of Moses, that he granted their request, but he sent leanness to their souls. He fattened them up with quail. They wanted meat. He gave it to them. But you see, they weren't trusting God. And that is the thing that is evident in that. And if they had only trusted the Lord and not have cried out and had been satisfied with manna, they would have found that their hearts would have been satisfied. There had been joy and peace in their lives. Oh, how many Christians today are way out yonder, head of the Lord, begging him for this and that and the other thing, and not willing to rest quietly and let God work out things in our lives. And it's true of many of us today that he grants our request. And somebody says, well, isn't that wonderful when he answers prayer? Not always. Sometimes we keep begging him for something, he gives it to us, and it's the worst thing that we could have. A very wealthy man in the state of Florida told me about his son. He's lost him. And he said, you know, the biggest mistake that I ever made was to give him everything that he wanted. Yes, God sometimes, when you and I just keep after him. But what happens? He sent leanness to their souls. And now we find that is true of the children of Israel. They should not have had Saul as king. He certainly is causing a problem. And David is puzzled. Why in the world are things happening to him like this? And verse 2, And he said unto him, God forbid, thou shalt not die. Now, this is Jonathan, his friend. Behold, my father will do nothing, either great or small, that he will show it to me. And why should my father hide this thing from me? It is not so. In other words, Jonathan says, if he makes a move to slay you, or whatever move he does make in order to slay you, I'll know about it. Now, he said to him, I want you to trust me, and I will communicate with him. And David swore moreover, and said, Thy father certainly knoweth that I found grace in thine eyes. And he saith, Let not Jonathan know this, lest he be grieved. But truly as the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, there is but a step between me and death. What a statement that is. And friends, that's not only true of David in that day, that's true of you and me today. And that doesn't mean those of us that drive the freeways of Southern California and the highways of this country today. The fact of the matter is that it doesn't make any difference who you are, where you are. You and I are in just a step of death. There is but a step between me and death. And Isaiah put it like this, that there's just a heartbeat between you and death, between you and me and death, I should say, because it could come to us any time. And that's the reason we ought to be ready to move out into eternity, into the presence of God, by the way. How many folk today have made every arrangement for this life, but have you made arrangement for the next life? If you should die at this moment, would you go into the presence of God, a saved individual, trusting Christ as your Savior? Well, may I say to you, you ought not to put it off any longer. Now we read in verse 4, Then said Jonathan unto David, Whatsoever thy soul desireth, I will do it for thee. He was a real friend of David. It's wonderful to have a friend like that. A friend, we're told, is one who sticketh tighter than a brother, because sometimes a brother lets you down, but a real friend never will. And a brother, we're told, is born for adversity. A man proves he's your friend 
when you're in trouble or when you need him. And Jonathan is proving just that. And he says to David, I'll do anything to protect you. Now we read in verse 5, And David said unto Jonathan, Behold, tomorrow is the new moon, and I should not fail to sit with the king at meat. But let me go, that I may hide myself in the field until the third day at even. In other words, he said, I should be back there to play for your father at meal time, but I'm afraid to go, and I'm going to disappear for three days. Now, if thy father at all miss me, then say, David earnestly asked leave of me that he might run to Bethlehem his city, for there is a yearly sacrifice there for all the family. If he say thus, it is well, thy servant shall have peace. But if he be very wroth, then be sure that evil is determined by him. You see, this was the way to find out the real feelings of Saul. And so the thing that Jonathan said is this, verse 9, And Jonathan said, Far be it from thee, for if I knew certainly that evil were determined by my father to come upon thee, then would not I tell it thee. Then said David to Jonathan, Who shall tell me? Or what if thy father answer thee roughly? And Jonathan said unto David, Come, and let us go out into the field. And they went out, both of them, into the field. And Jonathan said to David, O Lord God of Israel, when I have sounded my father about tomorrow, any time of the third day, and behold, if there be good toward David, and I then send not unto thee, and show it thee, the Lord do so and much more to Jonathan. But if it please my father to do the evil, then I'll show it thee, and send thee away, that thou mayest go in peace. And the Lord be with thee, as he hath been with my father." And thou shalt not only, while yet I live, show me the kindness of the Lord, that I die not, but also thou shalt not cut off thy kindness from my house forever. No, not when the Lord hath cut off the enemies of David, every one from the face of the earth. So Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David, saying, Let the Lord even require it at the hand of David's enemies. And Jonathan caused David to swear again because he loved him, for he loved him as he loved his own soul. Now, the thing that they were to do, and you will notice here that this man, Jonathan, proves his love by protecting him. He says, now, I will protect you. And the way that I'll communicate it to you, because obviously Jonathan would be watched very carefully, he says, the thing that I'll do is I'll come out here in the field and with my armor bearer, or the boy that carried his bow and arrows, he said, I'll come out here in the field for practice and I will shoot an arrow. Now, if I shoot the arrow beyond him and you, You'll be hidden here. I'll say the arrow is way out beyond. Now, that means that evil is determined against you and you should flee. If it's good concerning you, I'll not shoot the arrow so far. And I'll say to the boy when he goes to look for it, the arrow's not way down yonder. The arrow's this side of you. And you'll know that you can return. Now, that would be the way that Jonathan would communicate to David Well, the boy that was picking up the arrows wouldn't even know what was really back of what he's saying. And certainly, there would be no way for Saul to know that Jonathan had communicated with David. So David is hiding there in the third day, and out comes Jonathan with a word about Saul, and it was not favorable. Saul obviously wanted to slay him, and he said, made it very clear, the arrows way down yonder the other side of you, and that meant for him to flee. That is, David now is to leave. And what we have here is then after the armor bearer, the boy leaves, why David and Jonathan then get together because now it's obvious that he was out there for target practice and that was all. And the boy, apparently, and I have a notion the boy, 
would bring word back to the father of Jonathan, to Saul, and say, well, he didn't meet with David, but now that he's sent back, why, they meet together. And we read in the last verse of this 20th chapter, And Jonathan said to David, Go in peace far as much as we have sworn both of us in the name of the Lord, saying, The Lord be between me and thee, between my seed and thy seed forever. And he arose and departed, and Jonathan went into the city. Now, we'll follow David because he's going to flee, and this man is in real danger. And we'll find David is in danger from here on. But the thing that is interesting is this covenant that David and Jonathan made. And Jonathan kept his part of it. He was faithful and true to David to the very end of his life, and David was faithful and true to Jonathan. Now, we'll find out later on that after the slaying by the Philistines of both Saul and Jonathan, that David comes to the throne. Now, the proper thing and the safe thing would be to exterminate every member of the house of Saul. That would mean that if Jonathan had a son, he ought to exterminate him. Well, the fact of the matter is, Jonathan had a son. We're going to meet him a little later on. His name is Mephibosheth. He was a crippled boy. And when Saul and Jonathan were slain, a servant took this boy and hid him. But David is going to make good. And David found that boy, and he brought him into his palace and put him at his table and fed him from that day on <laughs> and took care of him. Why? He's making good his covenant. And he showed grace to him. I'll have occasion to deal with that, but just let me call attention to the wonderful meaning of that. David showed kindness to Mephibosheth because of Jonathan. God has shown kindness to you and me because of Christ. It's not because of who we are or what we've done, but because of the fact of what Christ has done for us and who Christ is, and that he loved us and died for us, and God gave his Son to die for us. And it's because of that that God extends that favor to us today. Now, Jonathan returns back to this palace, and I think a very sad man, because he knows his father now is determined to try to slay David. And David is told to get as far away as he possibly can. That brings me now to chapter 21, and here we find David fleeing to Ahimelech the priest. And notice what he does. Then came David to Nob, to Ahimelech the priest. And Ahimelech was afraid at the meeting of David and said unto him, Why art thou alone, and no man with thee? You see, David now is very much alone as he flees from Saul. And David said unto Ahimelech the priest, The king hath commanded me a business, and hath said unto me, Let no man know anything of the business whereabout I send thee, and what I have commanded thee, and I have appointed my servants to such and such a place. Now therefore... What is under thine hand? Give me five loaves of bread in mine hand, or what there is present. And the priest answered David and said, There's no common bread under mine hand, but there's hallowed bread, if the young man have kept themselves at least from women. The thought here is just simply this, that the bread that he had was on the table of showbread, and that was not to be eaten except by the priests, and only at a certain time. That was at the changing of the bread each Sabbath day. Now, David has with him his young man, of course. He's alone in the sense that all of the followers of Saul are not with him. No one with the livery of Saul is with him. The young men that are with him are not. And David, I think, still had the livery of Saul on, but he's soon to get rid of that. Now, notice what David does. David answered the priest and said unto him, 
Of a truth, women have been kept from us about these three days since I came not. And the vessels of the young men are holy, and the bread is in a manner common, yea, though it were sanctified this day in the vessel. You see, the thought here is this. Though it's dedicated for religious purposes, and it was a God-given religion, when you've got some people around that are hungry, then that bread becomes common place if it can't be used to feed the hungry mouths. And that is what he's saying. So the priests gave him hallowed bread, for there was no bread there but the show bread that was taken from before the Lord to put hot bread in the day when it was taken away. The thing that David is doing, he's breaking the law, and in a very special way. And you will recall that when they challenged the Lord Jesus about breaking the law, which he didn't do, but they challenged him on it, the Lord Jesus referred to this incident in the life of David. And what he's actually saying in his day is, if David could do it, there's one here greater than David, and he can do it also. That is, if a man's to be healed on the Sabbath day, or if good is to be done. Now, there happens to be a Judas Iscariot in the crowd, only has another name, and he's there, and he's going to betray David and also the high priest, by the way. Now, let me read verse 7. Now, a certain man of the servants of Saul was there that day, detained before the Lord, and his name was Doeg, an Edomite the chiefest of the herdmen that belonged to Saul. And this man Doag is here, and he's a betrayer. David had a great deal to say about the betrayer. You read Psalm 52, for instance. Now, verse 8, And David said unto Ahimelech, And is there not here under thine hand spear a sword? For I have neither brought my sword nor my weapons with me, because the king's business required haste. Now, I'd like to call your attention to something here that's rather important, friends. It's the way Scripture's misquoted. I've heard it said that certain things should be done for the Lord and should be done quickly because the king's business requires haste. Well, may I say to you, the king's business does not require haste. David is misrepresenting here to begin with. And he doesn't have a sword or spear because he did have to leave in a hurry. But he's not on a mission for the king. And therefore, the king's business does not require haste. This is, I suppose, quoted so many times. I've heard it used. We need to take up an offering to pay for something or to build something. And the king's business requires haste. Now, I'm here to say today the king's business does not require haste. Have you ever noticed how patiently that God works? And he's going to work that way in the life of David. David is going to be schooled and trained out in the caves of the earth. That's God's method. God is in no hurry. Now, Moses was in a hurry. And he wanted to deliver the children of Israel 40 years before God was ready. And Moses was not ready either. God put him out in the desert and trained him, schooled him for 40 years until he was ready. The thing that marks the work of God is not haste. It's the fact that God works slowly and patiently. Oh, my, how impatient we become. And I'm sure my wife would say, if she's listening at this time, she'd say, yes, and you are not the one to talk to people on patience because you're a very impatient man. And that's true. I am. I'm trying to learn the art of waiting before the Lord. We all need that. David needed to learn it. God has trained his men like that. He's had to teach them patience, every one that he's ever used. And you find that that is his method. He brought his son into the world. It'll be 33 years before he'll go to the cross. God moves slowly, and God works slowly. If you want to see the way he moves, look how long it takes him to make a diamond. Look how long it takes him to make a redwood tree. 
God takes a long time in what he's doing. God's work does not require haste, friends. That's not God's method at all. And David here is saying something that actually is not true. And the circumstances here reveal it's not true. He's not on a mission for the king. And the king's business does not require haste. Now you'll notice, And the priest said, The sword of Goliath the Philistine, whom thou slewest in the valley of Elah, behold, it's here wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. If thou wilt take that, take it, for there is no other save that here. And David said, There's none like that. Give it me. Isn't it interesting that David could use a slingshot when he began, but now he's been playing a harp, you see, for the king. He's been in the king's palace a long time, and he has lost his cunning with a slingshot. And now he needs a sword, and he uses the sword of Goliath. And so we find that David arose and fled that day for fear of Saul, and he went to Achish, the king of Gath. And he got as far away from Saul as he possibly could. And he went this far. And David found that when he arrived there among these foreigners, he was in danger. They were enemies of Israel. And he had to play like he was a madman. He had to act as Hamlet acted, you remember, and play like he was a madman in order to keep them from slaying him. And so we find in verse 15, the king of Achish says, Have I need of madmen that ye have brought this fellow to play the madman in my presence? Shall this fellow come into my house? So it means that David is not going to be in danger there. Now we will follow David here in chapter 22, And we'll get a little ways in this chapter. And this is quite a remarkable chapter, by the way. We begin now that period in David's life when he is hiding himself in the caves and dens of the earth, and he's learning that the king's business does not require haste. God is schooling him and training him as he's done all of his others. And during these years... He was driven out from King Saul, who sought to kill him. He was hunted and hounded. He was driven from pillar to post. He was forced to hide in the forests and the caves of the earth to escape the wrath of the king. He was, as he says in the Psalms, he says, I was hunted like a partridge. And again he says, I'm like a pelican of the wilderness. He says, I'm an owl of the desert. And he says, my soul is among lions. And he says, they prepared a net for my steps. David got very weary during those years of running away from Saul. And when Saul pressed him hard, he withdrew to the cave of Adullam. And it was a rocky mountain fast in the south, a highway through the valley between Philistia and Hebron, And let me now begin reading here in chapter 22. And I'll read beginning verse 1. We'll not get very far here. David therefore departed thence and escaped to the cave of Julam. And when his brethren and all his father's house heard it, they went down thither to him. And every one that was in distress and every one that was in debt And every one that was discontented gathered themselves unto him, and he became a captain over them, and there were with him about four hundred men. Now, this is a very marvelous section of the Word of God. There is a marvelous comparison that can be made between David and David's greater son, the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a period of David that compares to the present state of our Lord. You and I are living in the days of his rejection. The world has rejected him. Just as David was rejected and Saul was hunting him and his enemy was abroad, and our enemy is abroad today, Satan is like a roaring lion 
going up and down this earth. And David could say, My soul is among lions, and ours is too today. And it's during these days that the Lord Jesus Christ is calling out of this world a people to his name, those that are in distress, those that are in debt, and those that are discontented. Now, what kind of people are coming to him? Well, the same kind that came to David. There were three classes of men, those that were in distress. They were the ones that were persecuted and oppressed by Saul. And David was a long time in breaking with Saul, you know. And there were many that were loyal to Saul, but they were finally forced to flee. Their life was in danger. And they fled to David, and they joined up with him. Been many periods like that. There were a group of men in this country that had a tea party up in Boston years ago. Patrick Henry took his life in his own hand. And you find today about us, we're living in a world where someone has expressed it, corruption and injustice of the world will make you either a communist or a Christian. And if you have felt the whiplash of injustice of the world, if you have felt its unfairness and you are oppressed, you find no place to turn No appeal can be made to anyone. You're trying to find a way out. And even today, many are turning to all kinds of nostrums, some to drugs, some to drink, some to suicide. And there's one, though, that's calling you today, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. And he can help you. He wants to help you. For in that he himself hath suffered being tempted... He's able to succor them that are tested and tempted today because he was down here. Are you in distress? You need a Savior. And he's calling out those that will come to him today. Then there are the others that came to David during this time of his rejection. They were those that were in debt. And that's a cancer that destroys under any circumstance. And in that day, if a man got in debt, he could be sold into slavery. That was the Mosaic law. Men should have been protected, but they weren't. And this man saw he was just permitting them to be sold into slavery. And you see, sin today has made us debtors to God. In fact, you remember that wonderful prayer, not the Lord's prayer, but the disciples' prayer, says, "'Forgive us our debts.'" He alone can forgive us. And forgiveness always rests upon the payment of a debt. And those that were in debt, they had to flee. And David actually did not pay the debt, but Christ did. He paid the debt, and he set us free. That is, the Lord Jesus Christ did that for you and for me today. This is a very wonderful passage of Scripture, you can see, my beloved, it speaks of the one that paid the debt, and he made us free today, so that if you're in debt, and if you feel like today that you can't measure up, and you know that you're a debtor to God, well, he paid that debt for you, and you can come to him. You can flee to him today, and what a wonderful privilege that is. And we are told, therefore, Brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. We are debtors now to him, and we can come to him. And then those that were discontented came to David. That means they were bitter of soul. Circumstances and the experiences of life had soured them. May I say that I have noticed that in the past few years I discovered it When I became a pastor in downtown Los Angeles, there was a restlessness that was sweeping our land, and it's still abroad today. It's become a great flood. There have been since then the masses marching in protest about this thing, that thing, and the other. All over the world, they're marching. And there's an undercurrent of dissatisfaction and discontentment. My friend, life will make you better today unless you see the hand of God in your life like Joseph did. 
but there's one to go to today. He's the rejected king. He's fairer than 10,000. And he says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll rest you. He says, If any man thirst, let him come unto me. What a wonderful picture this is, and what a wonderful story it is, my friend. There came to David at this time his mighty man, those that were in distress, those that were in debt, those that were discontented. And there came to him 400 men. And today the Lord Jesus Christ is calling out of this world a people to his name. What a picture we have here. Now we follow on in this story of David and his years of wandering about. In many sense, what a sad period this is, though, in a way. And we'll see that something happened that was very sad indeed, and it must have been to David. I'm begin reading at verse 3 of First Samuel 22. And David went thence to Mizpah of Moab. And he said unto the king of Moab, Let my father and my mother, I pray you thee, come forth and be with you till I know what God will do for me. And he brought them before the king of Moab. Now, you know, this is the thing that another family that lived in Bethlehem did. They left Bethlehem, Judah, uh, Limelech, and his family. And that's where Ruth got into the Bible story. She was a Moabitess. And we find that David, though, now he goes to Moab. And that means he really was a frightened man. He got out of the land, and I do not think that he should have left the land at all. I think God would have protected him had he stayed in the land. He's like Abraham who went to Egypt, you see. And he brought them before the king of Moab, and they dwelt with him all the while that David was in the hole, that is, down in the cave at Adullam. And the prophet Gad said unto David, Abide not in the hole, depart, and get thee into the land of Judah. Then David departed and came into the forest of Harith. When Saul heard that David was discovered, and the men that were with him, now Saul abode in Gibeah under a tree in Ramah, having his spear in his hand, and all his servants were standing about him. Then Saul said unto his servants that stood about him, Here now, ye Benjamites, will the son of Jesse give every one of you fields and vineyards, and make you all captains of thousands and captains of hundreds, that all of you have conspired against me, and there's none that showeth me that my son hath made a league with the son of Jesse, and there's none of you that is sorry for me, or showeth unto me that my son hath stirred up my servant against me to lie in wait as at this day. I think that this man Saul, friends, is developing some paranoid tendencies. He's developed a persecution complex, and maybe he should have it, because he's discovered now his own son hasn't been loyal to him, and he's wondering why these men that were his cabinet haven't revealed it to him, and apparently they haven't. And we're told, though, that one here, and that is the fellow we saw down in the place where David had fled, and he was there when David was there. And we're told in verse 9, Then answered Doeg the Edomite, which was set over the servants of Saul, and said, I saw the son of Jesse coming to Nob, to Ahimelech, the son of Ahitub, and he inquired of the Lord for him, gave him victuals, gave him the sword of Goliath, the Philistine. Well, now King Saul's going after Ahimelech. The king sent to call Ahimelech the priest, the son of Ahitub, and all his father's house, the priests that were Nob, and they came all of them to the king. Saul said, Here now, thou son of Ahitub. And he answered, Here I am, my lord. Saul said unto him, Why have ye conspired? against me, thou and the son of Jesse, in that thou hast given him bread and a sword, and hast inquired of God for him, that he should rise against me to lie in wait as at this day. 
And notice the high motives of this man, Ahimelech. Then Ahimelech answered the king and said, And who is so faithful among all thy servants as David, which is the king's son-in-law, and goeth at thy bidding, and is honorable in thine house? Now, I believe that David later on felt very badly that he had deceived Ahimelech in making him think that he was on a mission for Saul. And for that's exactly what this man is saying to Saul, why, he's your son-in-law, and he was on a mission for you, and I was helping him. Notice now, did I then begin to inquire of God for him, be it far from me? Let not the king impute anything unto his servant, nor to all the house of my father, for thy servant knew nothing of all this, less or more. And he's being very honest, you see. And the king said, Thou shalt surely die, Ahimelech, thou and all thy father's house. And the king said unto the footman that stood about him, Turn and slay the priests of the Lord, because their hand also is with David, and because they knew when he fled and did not show it to me. But the servants of the king would not put forth their hand to fall upon the priests of the Lord. You see, they hesitated. But this man Saul has gone so far in his rebellion and sin that he wouldn't stop at anything. Now the king said to Doeg, Turn thou and fall upon the priest. Now this Edomite will do it. And Doeg the Edomite turned, and he fell upon the priest and slew on that day four score and five persons that did wear a linen effort. Now that was a serious thing that he did. And this was an awful crime, by the way, for King Saul. If God hadn't rejected him up to this point, why, certainly this would have caused him to do that. Now we are told, And Nob the city of the priests smote he with the edge of the sword, both men and women, children and sucklings, oxen and asses and sheep, with the edge of the sword. You see, the bitterness and the vengeance of this man Saul is terrible. And may I say to you that there is something that we need to be aware of today. You remember Paul speaks of that little root of bitterness, and it can get in the heart of many of God's people. And when it does, it's a vicious, awful thing. I've seen it in churches. I've seen maybe some man, some officer, use this office And not to bring glory to the name of Christ, but to just vent his spleen and his bitterness and his vengeance and his hatred against someone else. It can be anyone from the pastor down to the janitor of the church or a member of the church. And how terrible it is. Well, that is exactly what has happened in this particular case here. This man Saul is definitely Satan's man. And that's the reason you can't be too sure about some today that are active in the Lord's service when you see them motivated by such a vicious bitterness of heart and soul. It's difficult to call out tares and wheat at a time like that. But that was the case here. Now, we followed David during this time of his wanderings. And we come to chapter 23, verse 1. Then they told David, saying, Behold, the Philistines fight against Calah, and they rob the threshing floors. Therefore David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go and smite these Philistines? And the Lord said unto David, Go and smite the Philistines and save Keilah. And David's man said unto him, Behold, we be afraid here in Judah. How much more then if we come to Keilah against the armies of the Philistines? Then David inquired of the Lord yet again. And the Lord answered him and said, Arise, go down to Keilah, for I will deliver the Philistines into thine hands. So David and his men went to Keilah fought with the Philistines, and brought away their cattle, and smote them with a great slaughter. So David saved the inhabitants of Keilah. Now you see that he's acting in a 
way to protect God's people. But all this time, he continues to flee, and now he has actually 600 men with him. If you'll notice, verse 13, Then David and his men, which were about 600, arose and departed out of Keilah, and went whithersoever they could go. So David now, having delivered these people, he is told now the Lord to leave there, and he does. And Saul now is still on the trail of David, and he's told that that's where he was. And we are told in verse 14, And David abode in the wilderness and strongholds, and remained in a mountain in the wilderness of Ziph. And Saul sought him every day, but God delivered him not into his hand. And David saw that Saul was come out to seek his life, and David was in the wilderness of Ziph in a wood. And Jonathan, Saul's son, arose and went to David in the wood and strengthened his hand in the Lord. Notice how faithful and true Jonathan is to his friend David. And he says to him at this time, Thou shalt be king over Israel, and I shall be next unto thee, and that also Saul my father knoweth. He said, My father Saul knows what's going to happen, but he's fighting it. He's, of course, against God's will. He's in rebellion against God. But Jonathan is willing to do it. And by the way, Jonathan reveals here that he is a great man. I consider him a great man. His attitude and action actually remind us of John the Baptist, who said of the Lord Jesus, He must increase, but I must decrease. And so we find now that this man David is on the run. Verse 18, And they too made a covenant before the Lord, and David abode in the wood. Jonathan went to the house. And so David is hiding out. Now today, friends, we bring our study to the 24th chapter of 1 Samuel, and we continue on with David. David now is fleeing from Saul. He's being hounded. This was a period of testing in the life of David, and it, I think, changed him from a little innocent shepherd boy to a rugged man who became God's man and ruled over his people. But we find in this chapter here that David again spares Saul's life here at En Gedi. And the reason that he does it, he'll make very clear. We'll see that. Now let me move into this chapter. 1 Samuel 24, verse 1, and I'm reading. And it came to pass, when Saul was returned from following the Philistines that it was told him, saying, Behold, David is in the wilderness of En Gedi. Then Saul took three thousand chosen men out of all Israel and went to seek David and his men upon the rocks of the wild goats. Now, that means that David has really gone to a rugged place to hide out. And he does not have, we know, three thousand men. Saul's army greatly outnumbered David, but David could make up with strategy and the fact that he knew the area and his men were rugged men indeed. Now notice verse 2, Then Saul took these three thousand chosen men out of all Israel, and he went to seek David, and it was upon the rocks of the wild goats. And he came to the sheep coats by the way, where was a cave, and Saul went in to cover his feet. And David and his men remained in the sides of the cave. Now, Saul came into the very cave that David was hiding. And he goes to sleep. Well, of course, his men are on guard, but they are on guard outside, not on the inside of the cave. They're permitting the king to have privacy in order that he might get a good nap. Well, notice what happens. And the men of David said unto him, Behold, the day of which the Lord said unto thee, Behold, I'll deliver thine enemy into thine hand, that thou mayest do to him as it shall seem good unto thee. Then David arose and cut off the skirt of Saul's robe privily. 
That is, he quietly and privately slipped up and just trimmed off the lower part of the garment of King Saul. Now, it came to pass afterward that David's heart smote him because he'd cut off Saul's skirt. He regretted he'd done that because, actually, it was a source of embarrassment. Imagine when Saul waked up and stood up, and he's in a miniskirt. Well, that is something that even in that day, kings didn't do, was go around in miniskirts. Now, will you notice verse 6? He said unto his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing unto my master, the Lord's anointed, to stretch forth mine hand against him, seeing he is the anointed of the Lord. Now, what David is doing here is honoring the office, not the man. He respects the office, not the man. May I just interject this at this particular point? I personally do not think that the president of the United States, regardless of what party he belongs to, or regardless of who he is or how bad he might be, I do not think that he should ever be made a subject of a cartoon or the object of ridicule. Uh, He can be criticized in a democracy, of course, but to make him a subject of ridicule, as the cartoonists do of our presidents, I think it's entirely wrong and for comedians to attempt to imitate them. Now, that's just my personal opinion, but I think that we ought to have more respect for the office than we do, because you and I live in a country that has its faults, but it's been a great country and a good country to most of us, and it's because of the form of government we've had so far. I do not know what the future holds, but this is my comment relative to that. And you will notice at least how David, and David is being hunted by this man. David won't lay a hand on him. Why? Because of the fact that he's God's anointed, and he's going to let God deal with him. My, if we could only get to the place where we let God handle our enemies. Most of us want to handle them. But God can do a better job. You remember he said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. And that simply means this. God says that when you and I take these things in our own hands, we're no longer walking by faith. We're not trusting him. What we're really saying is, Lord, we can't trust you to handle this as we want it handled, so we're going to take it in our hands. And David now is going to let God handle King Saul. And I think the Lord will do a pretty good job, by the way, before he's through with him. And David now is really embarrassed. The fact of the matter is, his conscience disturbs him because he actually is making the king a subject of ridicule. Imagine a man standing up with a miniskirt on. That's exactly what happened. Now, verse 7, So David stayed his servants with these words and suffered them not to rise against Saul. He would not permit his men. And I'll tell you, several of those men had no use for him, and they would have killed him in a moment. But David would not permit it. But Saul rose up out of the cave and went on his way. And David also rose afterward and went out of his cave and cried after Saul, saying, My Lord, the king. And when Saul looked behind him, David stooped with his face to the earth and bowed himself. You see, he respects him. It's the office, not the man. And David said to Saul, Wherefore hearest thou men's words, saying, Behold, David seeketh thy hurt? Behold, this day thine eyes have seen how that the Lord had delivered thee today into mine hand in the cave, and some bade me kill thee, but mine eyes spared thee. And I said, I'll not put forth mine hand against my Lord, for he's the Lord's anointed. And actually... He's demonstrated now to King Saul he's not seeking his life. Saul has been told, wrongly of course, David was much misunderstood, but he's much maligned also and misrepresented by both friend and enemy, I think. And so we find here he's making it clear to Saul that he was not seeking his life at all. Now I'm going to drop down because what you have here is David 
makes it very clear to Saul that he's not seeking his life. And he would like to have had Saul let up from hunting him. But actually, this just really antagonizes this man Moa, because he actually, at this time, I'm of the opinion he's demon-possessed. An evil spirit came upon him. Verse 20 now, let me read these last three verses. And now, behold, I know well that thou shalt surely be king, and that the kingdom of Israel shall be established in thine hand. Now, will you notice Saul's statement here? This is something that is quite amazing. Saul knew it and is greatly moved by what David does. We're told here that he wept. And now he acknowledges that he knows that he is to be king. And he says here now, Swear now therefore unto me by the Lord, that thou wilt not cut off my seed after me, and that thou wilt not destroy my name out of my father's house. And David swore unto Saul, and Saul went home. But David and his men get them up into the hole. David doesn't trust him, you see. David gets farther and farther into the wilderness to hide because he knows there'll come a day when Saul will come after him again. 